Welcome to another week of adult Bible study at First Baptist Church, Gainesville, Florida. I'm Pastor Eric Spivey, and I'm so thankful that you're journeying with us through the Sundays of Advent as we rediscover the significance of Christmas by looking at the Incarnation. Today in worship, we are lighting the second candle of Advent. And last week, we talked about the idea that Jesus came to earth as the King of Kings. And this week, we're thinking about Jesus coming to earth as our Savior. And so, I'll be preaching on it on this, this Sunday morning as we, go, as we have our Hanging of the Green service. But now, I want you to pay special attention to Adam Hamilton, the pastor who's leaving our, leading our Bible study, and allow him to walk us through the ways that we need to be saved at Christmas time. Where can you find... Um, hope in your sinfulness, hope in your despair, hope in your meaningless, um, in places we have a hard time finding meaning, and it all can be done when we think about Jesus as our Savior. So now, let Adam take it from here. Maybell and I are delighted to join you for a second week of our study, Incarnation, Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas. And as we do that, I want to turn our attention to the passage of Scripture that we find in Luke's Gospel, where the angel announces to the shepherds on the night of Jesus' birth that the Savior has been born. Listen to these words. I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Now, last week we talked about the title Messiah or Christ. And in the last week in the study, we're going to talk about the title Lord. But today we want to focus our attention on the title Savior. Now, when we think about the word Savior, I just remind you, we learned that Messiah or Christ appears over 500 times in the New Testament as a title for Jesus. It meant the anointed one, and it pointed to him as our king. When it comes to Savior, this is the only term used for Jesus more often than Christ. And you might, if you searched for it in the New Testament in a word search program, you wouldn't be able to find it, not very often. But what we know is that Jesus' very name means Savior. It means God saves. When we turn to Matthew's gospel, we read these words. When, when uh, Joseph is having a dream at night and God reveals this to him in a dream, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for Mary will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the name Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, means Yahweh saves, Yahweh delivers. And what we want to ask is, what does it mean to be saved by Yahweh? What does it mean to be saved by Jesus? How does he save us? Why do we even need to be saved? What does that salvation look like? And here I would tell you that Christians, I think, have a really paltry understanding of the salvation of Jesus. I mean, we focus on one thing. He saves us from the consequences of our sins. That means he saves us from hell. So we think about Jesus as our Savior. Hello, Mabel. We think about Jesus as our Savior, and he's going to deliver us from the fire of hell. He's going to forgive our sins. Now, that's really important. He's going to save us from the consequences of our sins. But there's a lot more to Jesus being Savior than that. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So as we think about that, I want us to focus our attention on, uh, first of all, the idea of sin. So the Greek word for sin is hamartia, and it's an archery term. Many of you know this. It's a term that literally meant if you, if you fired an arrow from a bow and you missed the target, what happened was hamartia. You missed the mark. You missed the target. And so the idea is that there is a target. There is a mark that we're meant to pursue. There is a way that we're meant to live our lives in thought, word, and deed towards God and towards other human beings. There are things we're meant to do and things we're meant not to do. And, uh, and as we ponder that, I want to think about the things in our own lives that we do or fail to do that we should have done. As we think about this, I think, of course, about poverty, injustice, racism, abuse. There's no shortage of things that we can think of that are sins, that, that are ways in which we have failed God. Materialism, a whole host of others. I also think of the seven deadly sins within the Catholic tradition. Lust, gluttony, greed, indifference, sometimes called sloth, anger or hate, envy and pride. I look at that list of the seven deadly sins. They're, they're seen as the cardinal sins, and all the other sins flow out from these. And the truth is I've violated all of those many times in my life in thought, word, and deed by what I've done or left undone. Jesus came to save us from our sin. The Greek word in the New Testament is sozo. And sozo is like the Hebrew equivalent. It, it means more than just to save. It means to deliver. It means to rescue. It means to heal. And so when we think about Jesus as Savior, we're also saying Jesus is our healer as our rescuer, as our deliverer. So as we ponder that, when we talk about being saved by Jesus, we're talking about more than just being saved from the consequences of our sins, that is uh, to be rescued from going to hell. We're really thinking about a much broader understanding of salvation. And that's what I want you to ponder as you're thinking about this in your study of the second chapter. Now, 
recently, somebody on Facebook had sent a note to me. I had been preaching a sermon about racism and actually a couple of sermons about racism in response to viral videos that showed that racism is still a serious problem in our country and in response to the death, the murder of two African-American men. And uh, this woman wrote, she is uh, new to our church. She'd been worshiping with us online. And and she wrote and she said, you know, I I really was disappointed that you didn't preach about salvation uh, today. You didn't preach about being saved by Jesus and that you didn't call people to be saved. And I thought that's so interesting because I think that's what that entire sermon was about. It was about Jesus saving us from our racism, saving us from our racial biases, saving us from the from the sin in our lives in this particular area. Sin is a, is a is consequential. It has an impact on our lives and on the world. And in calling people to repent of their racism and to turn to Jesus and to listen to his voice, calling us to live a life of love, selfless, sacrificial love, and to lay aside our biases and our racism, I, I felt we were talking about salvation. And and here's the thing, salvation, again, I'm going to say it a second time, is not simply about saving us from the fires of hell by Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. That, of course, is a really important part of salvation. But it goes deeper than that. He wants to save us today. He wants to save us now. He wants to save us from ourselves, to deliver us from the things that, that are in our lives that miss the mark. He wants to use us to bring healing to a broken world. He wants to transform us from the inside out. He wants to save us from the tapes that play in our, in our minds, from the things that happened in our childhood, the sins that happened to us. He wants to deliver us from the consequences of other people's sins inflicted upon us. And he wants to use us to deliver the world from humanity's sin. When I think about this, and I think of all the all of the ways that Jesus delivers us and saves us, I, I see him redeeming us. I see him purchasing us, buying us, teaching us by his words and his example, by his spirit transforming us so that we might become the people God wants us to be, that we might be transformed so that we don't miss the mark, but instead pursue the mark that God intends for us. And as I think about that in Jesus' entire saving work, it wasn't just as he was dying on the cross that he was saving us. It was in his birth, in his life in his teaching, in his ministry, in his healing, in his suffering, in his death, and in his resurrection, that Jesus was saving us, healing us, delivering us. So this idea that Jesus saves us and that that salvation is much broader than simply paying for our sins so that we can go to heaven, but has to do with the way he saves us from ourselves and saves us for himself and saves us to be instruments of his healing, rescuing, and deliverance in the world, is something that's captured in this painting that you see over the fireplace. So 17 years ago, I purchased this painting. It, uh, I was in an antique bookstore. It's called Spivey's. They've since closed, but it was one of my favorite places to go in Kansas City. Old Spivey, he had all these antique books and maps, and every once in a while, he'd, he'd have works of art. And I was in this place, and in the back room, he had this painting, and it was laying on the ground. Actually, it was tilted against the wall, but just you know, from the ground. And, and uh, it was sort of tattered and torn, the, the painting actually literally had a four inch tear across the top and four inches across and three inches down. And it was, you know, covered with soot and, uh, but you could still make out what was in the painting. It it wasn't fitting in the frame quite properly. And, and I was looking at it and and it really captured my heart. Uh, it shows a scene from the 19th century England as people are putting up the hay. And there's a little church you can see in the background, but there's a storm that's coming in there. You know, long before John Deere tractors, they were, they were just quickly trying to get the hay in before the, before the, the winds and the, and the rain swept in. And, and, and it caught my eye because, you know, my wife and I live on 13 acres and we put up hay here every year. And I know what it's like to know that it's going to rain that evening and you want to hurry up and get the bales into the barn. And, and so I just, there was something about the painting really spoke to me. And I just found myself staring at it. And finally, I went to Spivey. I said, hey, Spivey, what are you selling this painting for? I'm expecting he's going to tell me a couple hundred bucks. And he says, oh, yeah, $1,300. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. $1,300? bucks. do not you see? It's torn. It's not even fitting in the frame. And it's, it's, all, it's got soot over it. And, and he says, hey, it's worth a lot more than that. You know. And I looked at it, and I thought, hmm, I don't see that. He said, no, if you restored it, if you paint it, you, know, you pay to restore it or restore it, they can, they can fix it up, and it's worth a lot more. And he told me the name of the artist. So I called my uncle, who buys and sells art from time to time, and I said, hey, can you look up this artist and tell me what this kind of painting would be worth? And he said, well, you know, if it's in good shape, it was cleaned up, it would be worth five or $6,000. And so I turned to Spivey, and I said, well, come on, can you give me any kind of deal on it? And I think he gave me $100 off. And I bought it. And uh, brought it home, and my wife looked at it and thought, are you crazy? Why would you buy a painting like this? I said, well, it could be restored. It could be restored. Anyway, before I left the store, after I'd written out the check, I said, okay, Spivey, tell me the rest of the story. Like, where did you get this painting? He said, I found it in a flea market. It was in a stack of stuff, that they, stack of things that they were probably going to throw away. 
and I paid 25 bucks for it. He smiled. I said, wait a minute, you paid 25 bucks and you sold it to me for $1,200? He said, yeah, it's worth a lot more than that. Anyway, uh, I get brought it home. I took it to an art restorer and uh, Peggy Van Witt in Kansas City, and she restored it. She cleaned it. She restretched it, put it back in the frame. She uh, repaired the tear, and you'd never know there was a tear there now. And every time I look at it, you know, I look at this painting and it means far more. I love it far more than just the scene for the scene of them putting up the hay in advance of the rain. I've come to love it because it paints a picture for me of what Jesus does for us and how he saves us. You see, he sees us when other people say we have no value or worth. And he says, you have great worth to me. How much? He's willing to pay his own life. He's willing to lay down his life for us. He redeems us. He buys us when we were ready to be cast aside. And then he carefully, by the work of his spirit and by, by his teaching and by his example, he carefully restores us. He heals us. He cleans us up. And, and he makes us what we were intended to be as we follow him. So he heals us. He saves us from ourselves and from our sin and from our brokenness. He saves us for himself so we become objects of his, of his love and affection. And then he saves us that we might be objects of his healing and salvation and deliverance and rescuing in the world around us. That's what Jesus does. He doesn't only save us from hell. He saves us from ourselves. He saves us for himself. And he uses us as instruments of healing in this world. And that's what I hope you see as you're studying this chapter. Would you bow in prayer with me? God, how grateful we are that you sent Jesus to be our Savior. Jesus, we trust in you as our Savior. Save us from ourselves, from our sin, from our complicitness in things we don't even understand. Save us for yourself. Form us and shape us by the power of your Holy Spirit to be the people you want us to be, so that we might not miss the mark, so that we might be instruments of your healing in this world. To that end, we offer ourselves to you in your holy name. Amen.